Oh, great. Here's my, my remote. Um, well, thank you all very much for being here. Um, so I'm a guy who's interested in science, and I'm interested in creativity. Um, but as a science -y guy, I'm also like kind of an atheist. But both of these things actually brought me to meditation, which is really interesting to me. But not to some of the, you know, kind of far out aspects of it. But I did once ask a meditation teacher, like, what's the whole deal with the whole karma thing? And he was like, well, it's not that, you know, like what goes around comes around, or that cutting off someone in traffic means you'll never get a good parking spot. It's more kind of complicated than that. And that made sense to me, but as I kind of studied neuroscience a little bit more and studied things like social science as a psychologist, I actually came to disagree at least that part about kind of how we drive affecting whether we get a good parking spot. So I want to explain to you how this kind of works. Now we've probably all had that experience where we're driving in rush hour traffic and you know we're kind of going so slowly and then we see someone kind of in the distance just trying to cut us off. Right? That, you know, well, you can think of a creative adjective for how you might describe them, right? But we have a dilemma in that moment, right? Do we listen to the kinder angel on our shoulder and wave them in? Or do we listen to that devil on our shoulder and just like do the thousand yard stare, like I'm never gonna let them in, that person doesn't exist, right? And so before I kind of get into what the parking gods or karma or whoever decides what happens, whether we let them in or not, let's look at like why we might let them in or not let them in. Now we know about human behavior that it's based on two things, right? Nature and nurture, biology and like our social experiences and the kind of events that happen in our lives. Nature is like our DNA and our biology and you know, other things you see up on this list here. Nurture is like our childhood experiences, our parents, the friendships that we have, like they say are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? These kinds of things influence us and even our driver's ed teacher to some extent. So we start out with this blueprint of DNA, and then that kind of combines with, with our nurture experiences that we have. But where does that kind of DNA even come from in the first place? And one thing that's interesting is that kind of over the last few years, there's a new aspect of genetic science that's actually overturned decades of understanding, and this is called epigenetics. And it's actually how our nurture experiences actually affect our nature, they affect our DNA. So these scientists basically, what they did was they found some genetically identical mice and they basically just like stressed out half of them, right? And what they found compared to their genetically identical brothers and sisters was that a few months later, those mice were acting differently, no big surprise, because they were stressed out, but they, they did a blood test and they found that their genes had actually kind of turned on and off in certain ways that were different than the mice that had the low stress life of like, you know, hamster wheel workouts and sleeping in sawdust and all that kind of stuff. And what they found that was even more interesting was that those mice that experienced the stress, these kind of genetic changes that they saw, they saw them in those mice's children and in their grandchildren as well. So that some of the genetic information that was being passed down was actually starting to change just based on their experience. So what does this mean for us? Well, for a lot of us, if we look at our family tree, maybe we've had our grandparents or our ancestors have had some traumatic experiences, right? War, slavery, genocide, poverty, all of these things may have affected the way your grandparents' genes started to express themselves, and that actually affects the DNA that you're walking around with today in terms of what's kind of turned on and off in that DNA. And so we kind of think about, we have this genetic setup, and then we think about our experiences on that day that we drive home in rush hour traffic, and you know, maybe we had a bad night's sleep, and we ate some junk food or nothing at all. We got in a fight with our best friend or our partner or something like that, and we're in a bad mood, and we get into traffic, and we're kind of in that fight or flight mode, because the world doesn't seem like a safe place. You know, it's kill or be killed, it's cut off in traffic or cut that person off in traffic, and we decide to cut them off. And a few things actually happen when we do that. We actually rewire our brain. We know that actually forming a habit, right? We do something today, we do it tomorrow. In our brain, we do something today, it creates a neural pathway, and we're more likely to do that tomorrow. And a few things also happen in different parts of our brain. So when we're stressed, cortisol is the stress hormone. That blocks our ability to feel kind of compassionate with oxytocin, the love hormone. The limbic system, which is where we feel strong emotions, that shuts down our ability to think clearly and take perspective on the situation. And then we cut that person off, and then we're kind of a nasty person. People, that gets reinforced. People don't like us so much. 
We keep seeing the world as a dangerous place where we should only fight and flee from situations, and that gets reinforced day by day as well. And so we go ahead and we just cut that person off in traffic, and then kind of what happens over time is the neurons that fire together wire together with neuroplasticity, and then even in terms of our genes, they start to change. I've got this quote up here. It says, if you think of the stress system as preparing you for fight or flight, you might imagine these epigenetic changes prepare you to fight harder and flee faster the next time you encounter something stressful like rush hour traffic, right? Changing our genes in this way. And this thing is that it doesn't actually stop with us. It actually starts to trickle outward. So that how I act affects other people. It doesn't just affect me and how I feel, but I cut that person off in traffic. They're actually more likely to then go home and snap at their kids, send them up to bed without any dessert, and then those kids start to do something different. They kick the dog on the way up the stairs. They go to bed unhappy. They wake up unhappy. Their gene expression starts to change itself so that those genetic materials get passed on to their kids and their grandkids that say you should fight and flee from all these just mildly stressful situations like rush hour traffic. But let's pause there and think about what happens when we do decide to listen to the kinder angels of our nature and just let that person go in traffic. What happens and why? And so again, there's some of that nature, there's some of that nurture that's part of it, right? Maybe even in our family tree, our grandparents did experience some difficult things, but maybe they went to therapy or they got help or they you know, worked on their issues and their genetic material didn't actually change to kind of send these messages on down to, to your parents and, and on to you eventually. And maybe even they did or they didn't, but maybe you had a pretty good day, right? You got a good night's sleep. You ate a healthy meal that day. You laughed with your friends. The sun was shining. You weren't in a rush. You're in a good mood. The world seems like a safe place. And letting someone go in traffic doesn't seem like a big deal, right? So you go ahead and you're able to let them in because you're not in fight or flight. You're in that kind of mode where you're able to kind of think, use your whole brain, see the whole big picture, and think, oh, maybe they're just rushing their sick kid to the hospital today, right? And then your, your, your brain's actually also, you're kind of able to be compassionate with the oxytocin flowing, and you think, I'm going to do something kind because that feels good. And you go ahead and you wave them in. And we know when we do nice things, right, people tend to like us. So that gets reinforced again and again. And so I keep doing nice things. It becomes a habit to do those nice things when I wave them in in traffic like the you know, nice guy that I am or whatever. And then that changes my brain. So I have the habit of doing nice things and driving like a nice guy every day in traffic. And I also have a few hits of some different neurotransmitters. So I get serotonin, which regulates mood and anxiety. I get a hit of oxytocin, which makes me feel kind of all warm and fuzzy for the next few hours. And I get dopamine, which is a reward transmitter that actually makes me feel good and positive as well. And when we do good, we feel good because we're actually strengthening the parts of our brain that are associated with, with connection and trust with other people. And then my genes don't change to kind of send that genetic material onward either. But also this same social contagion thing happens. So these researchers, James Fowler and Nick Christiakis, they're at Emory and at Yale, and they've studied social contagions, and they found that even just witnessing one act of generosity actually leads to people kind of being kinder three degrees of separation away. So I go ahead and I wave that person in in traffic, and they maybe you know, make extra cookies for the kids before bed. The kids go to bed happy. They scratch the dog's tummy on the way upstairs. The kids wake up happy. They wake up happier and more resilient. They grow up more resilient. They pass new, more resilient genetic material onto their kids and their grandkids going forward, right? And so one of the things that's amazing about generosity and kindness is that the research is finding, and we all know that it feels good when we get something, right? But the research is finding that we actually feel better when we give something away. So there was a study that, that basically gave people a $5 bill. And they said, you can either keep this or you can give it away. Now, what happened that surprised the researchers, as well as the kind of subjects in the research study, was the people that gave away the $5 bill. There you go. Give it away, if you like, or keep it. But they felt better than the people who kept it. So there's a guy named Richie Davidson who studies this stuff. And what he says is that the best way to activate positive emotion circuits in the brain is through acts of generosity. And so. What we know is when we're kind in traffic or whatever situation, I'm happier, more optimistic. The people around me are happier. 
my kids, even my grandkids are happier, wired for more resilience, kind of going forward into the generations, right? Okay, Chris, this is all interesting, but where's my parking spot? Okay, I'm getting there. I've got one last study that I wanna share with you that I find really interesting. It's by a guy with the greatest name for a scientist ever. His name is Richard Wiseman. Okay, so he did this study where he wanted to kind of see how optimists and pessimists, happy people and unhappy people, perceive the world in different ways, what kinds of things they see. So he gave them all a newspaper, and he said, I want you to count the number of photographs in the newspaper. Now what happened? The optimists finished the job in just a few seconds. The pessimists, they took actually a few minutes. They took much longer. But he did a little bit of a trick when he did this experiment, which was in the second page of the newspaper, there was an ad that said, stop counting, there are 43 photographs in the newspaper. Now the optimists were able to tune into this kind of creative opportunity right in front of them, but the pessimists just looked right past it. They both had the same opportunity right there, but it was only the people that were happy and optimistic that were really able to kind of tune into these different chances that, that were right there in front of everybody where the pessimists just kind of tuned it back out. So what does this mean to me? Well, to me it means that maybe my meditation teacher and my driver's ed teacher were kind of on the same page and maybe they should have taught me you know, that like when the driver is ready, the parking spot appears or something you know, kind of wise and sage like that. Because when we're feeling happy and optimistic and that parking spot opens up, we're able to see it when we're in that kind of good mood from how we've acted before in traffic on that day. So here's what I encourage you to do. I encourage you to take a page from the playbook of my good friend, Shireen. Now, Shireen sounds like a person I'm making up, but I swear to God, she's real. Um, I just happened to change her name. Shireen grew up in Pakistan Muslim. She went to Catholic school. She's now an atheist. She's actually in 12-step recovery from alcoholism, and she practices Buddhist meditation. She kind of believes in everything, and she kind of believes in nothing. But what she does believe in, and she inspired this talk, actually, is acts of kindness. And what she does, her act of kindness, is actually just every day she lets one person go in front of her in traffic. Now around where we live, whatever you believe, that probably qualifies for like sainthood or some kind of incredible afterlife or heavenly realm or rebirth or something like that, right? But what we do know, at least from the science, is what that definitely qualifies her for is more happiness, more resilience, more happiness for herself, her family, maybe even some strangers too, right? More resilience for her kids going forward and maybe better odds of a good parking spot. So what I encourage you to do as well going forward, if you want more happiness, optimism, resilience, and creativity in your life, is to consider just one act of kindness a day, whatever you want that to be. And in that way, you'll make yourself happier, more optimistic and resilient, your friends, some strangers, your own kids and grandchildren, and, and so on and so on, and maybe even changing the course of human evolution toward greater kindness, greater generosity, and greater compassion going forward. Thank you so much.